Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lorna Condon. I'm the senior curator <clears throat> of the Library and Archives at Historic New England in Boston. I'm also delighted to be a new board member of the Ephemera Society. This afternoon, it is my pleasure to introduce Dale Kaplan. Dale is vice president, director of photographs and photo books, and an auctioneer at Swan Galleries. Dale appears regularly as a photographs specialist on PBS's popular Antiques Roadshow, and has also appeared as a commentator on photographic images on the History Channel, HGTV, and the Discovery Channel. Dale is a champion of photography in all of its myriad forms, and has lectured extensively about collecting, Dale speaks from personal experience. Recently, uh, the re recently published book, Pop Photographica Image Objects, highlights three-dimensional photographs from her collection. She has contributed essays to Click, Photography Changes Everything, published by Aperture in 2012. The, um, De appraising Art, The Definitive Guide by Appraisers Association of America, published in 2013. The Education of a Photographer by Allworth Press, published in 2007. And In the Vernacular, Photography of the Everyday, which was a Boston University art gallery publication. She has written about Lewis Hine and Albert Arthur Allen and serves on the board of directors of the Palm Beach Photographic Center and the board of advisors of the W. Eugene Smith Memorial Fund. She is also a member of Art Table, POW or POW Arts, and the Authors Guild. So this afternoon, please welcome Dale Kaplan. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's really a privilege and honor to be here. I've always been a fan of the Ephemera Society, and to be invited to speak to you is just terrific. So um, as you were told, I've been at Swan Galleries, an auction house, for many years. But my background is as a curator and scholar. Um, in my late 20s, I had an opportunity to work with a collection of half a million photographs that was owned by the United Methodist Church. And in the course of organizing a research, an archival program for them, I came across a bunch of images of young kids out and about that were uncredited but had really spoken to me in some way. And like uh, a bright 27-year-old, I decided I'm going to find out who made these pictures. And to make a long story short, they were among Lewis Hines' lost European photographs, 100,000 prints at the American Red Cross uh, in the Library of Congress, where a librarian had organized them in a very fastidious fashion, but no one had the cataloging code. So I broke the cataloging code. Um, so I've always imagined myself in a trench coat and fedora, so if you can just kind of use that, we'll enter the world of Lewis Hine. So Lewis Hine, as the short bio indicates, Born in the Midwest, 1874, um, lovely middle, middle class family. And at the age of 13, his father passes away in a terrible accident. So Hein has, as the youngest child, suddenly has to step in and start working. And as a result, is exposed to a quality of life a 14-hour workday as a janitor in a bank, um, disrespect, I needn't go into the details, that gives him a kind of empathy and worldview that's very visual. He studies sculpture as a kid, 
that he can transition into photography. Um, he's invited by someone he meets serendipitously who encourages him to study. He takes classes at the University of Chicago, apparently with Dewey. And together, he and Frank Manny, this mentor, come to New York, where Hein is offered a job teaching nature study and geography at the Ethical Culture School, which is a first-generation immigrant educational institution. So Frank Manny looks at the student body, recognizes their young children of immigrants, and decides what better lesson to give these kids than to take them to Ellis Island. Hein, in the meantime, is aware of Alfred Stieglitz, whose photograph we see on the right, the famous steerage, which apparently when Picasso saw, he said to, St to Stieglitz, you have made two photographs in one, referring, of course, to the composition. As you probably know, these are folks going back to Europe, not landing at Ellis Island. And Hein takes his camera to the streets, to the Lower East Side, where he begins to develop an iconography that's very much that of a street photographer. This is Hein, pictured on the right. I think we could characterize him as a diminutive fellow. The camera that he's using is the same camera that Alfred Stieglitz used, a five by seven inch Graflex. It um, needed glass plate negatives. You see that he's looking in the ground glass. The image is upside down. Uh, the camera's heavy. So it's not a 35 millimeter, God, I'm really dating myself. It's not a point and shoot digital camera. It's a camera that requires intention, integrity, composition, and as you can see, an ability to engage with his subject. You can't just pull out a Graflex and shoot willy-nilly. This is one of the first photos that Hein made that he considered a quote-unquote bullseye. Uh, it's the German printer at the Ethical Culture School. And to me, this is a very symbolic image because um, when we think of photography, for many years, I think photography was um, considered something of ephemera. I mean, it wasn't until the 1960s where there's uh, a photo market beginning to develop in New York and San Francisco, a sense of the fine art photographic print. So these images, these photographic prints that are being made aren't necessarily credited, certainly aren't signed. They're used in newspapers and magazines. So the printer and that person's technical virtuosity at translating a photograph is really important. And we'll see that Hein keys into that. Again, some of the images that were being made on the streets of the Lower East Side. These pictures predate his child labor work where he was hired as an investigator. I should say these were done 1904, 1905, 1906. By 1908, he's working for the National Child Labor Committee and becoming an investigative reporter. In other words, a photojournalist. So, can you believe it? <laughs> These are images associated with the Spanish-American War. We know about the competition between Pulitzer and Hearst, who can sell more newspapers, who can figure out a way to feed the public, to build a frenzy, and uh, <laughs> This is, uh, I think, something we're very familiar with today. Uh, so the notion of 
journalism not necessarily embodying the truth at the turn of the last century. And here's a photographer who's Midwestern, he's sincere, he believes in the uh, ability of photography to change people's attitudes and lives because as we know from this conference and from reading um, other texts, there's a real resistance to this, this uh, immigration, this wave of immigration, my grandparents, of course, being part of that. Um, so Hein, in addition to being a fantastic photographer, had a real beautiful literary style, a sense of how to convey information in a way that's uh, humanistic, succinct. And he says here, I select the more pictorial personalities. When I do portraits, it is in this way I can illustrate my thesis, the human spirit is the big thing after all. So this kind of template that he superimposes over the other, these individuals, families, kids coming to the states, not being welcome, um, begins to create a new iconography, and what does he wind up doing with his pictures, but finding progressive publications in which to reproduce them. I'm sorry, I can't resist. So this relates to the main, the ship that resulted in the Spanish-American War, the sinking of the ship, I should say. So this is the environment that's circulating, um, again, in the journalistic community. And when we look at the type of individual that Hein is photographing, and this is really uh, the trajectory throughout his career, it's interesting that he finds a figure that to me is very much like the figure that Walt Whitman presents himself as, um, in his first published book, Leaves of Grass. And this kind of idea of the laborer, the idea of the dignity of the laborer, uh, the clothing, the facial expression, it's really interesting because Hein was so well read and he is someone who uses a lot of literary references in his articles and letters. In the 1890s, there was another photographer who made images of immigrants disembarking at Ellis Island, uh, a clerk at Ellis Island whose name was Augustus Sherman. Uh, it's very interesting to look at his images, which certainly have a humanist quality, and uh, in fact, just last year, a scholar did some research and uh, was able to colorize these photographs so that the details and ornamentation associated with native costumes could really be writ large. Um, but unlike Hein, Sherman was a lifelong administrator. So Hein, on the other hand, through Frank Manny, meets Paul Kellogg, the editor of a progressive magazine called The Charities and the Commons, and Paul Kellogg recognizes photography. This is a new art form. Let's see how we can use it. And in the 1890s, with the invention or introduction of the halftone screen and the ability to offer photos and text on the same page, his magazine really runs with that ball. And soon after, they change the name to the Survey Graphic. <laughs> Hein is also hired by Florence Kelly of the Consumers League, who's very concerned about immigrants and their um, living conditions. And a lot of his pictures um, associated with women and children, women and children working, homework, tenement work, are also reproduced in the charities in the commons. Makes this trip to Ellis Island, and again, I think that there's a quality about this picture 
that belies the technical <laughs> difficulty of shooting um, a moving subject. And so I want to uh, introduce this information without it being overriding because when we talk about photography of this period, there are so many factors that key in to being a talented photographer, being someone who, as um, I hope you'll see, transitions from this documentary practice to being recognized as a fine art photographer. And so here's another Hein quote, photography is an empathy towards the world. It's so simple, it's so beautiful, and it speaks volumes to what he's doing. And I might add, pretty much doing alone. There aren't photographers that are like signing up to be a social documentary photographer in the early 20th century. So here we are at Ellis Island. Frank Manny is again the mentor, the father figure, the person who's like, hey, I'll hold the flash powder, you take the photo. Because what are we looking at in this facility? A very dark, somewhat dingy environment where getting the details of facial expressions, of the clothes people are wearing, the bags they're carrying, it's going to take flash. It's going to take additional light. And what does this flash do? It produces volumes of smoke. Oh, and before that, a gigantic bang. So if you're an immigrant and you're in this new environment where people are maybe not so friendly and some guy comes up to you with a flash pan and uh, I mean, again, that empathy, that ability to engage with your subject, um, I only wish I met him. So his photographs, uh, many of them have a hand stamp, have multiple hand stamps, in fact, which is really great because that's how we can date some of these prints. So again, with photography, we're looking at the image, the picture, and then we're looking at the photographic print, the tangible object. And with Hein, these photographic prints tend to be five by seven inches. They're contact prints. So. Um, this one has his handwritten notation, and um, what he does as a business person is he basically is creating his own picture agency. So he has the set number, he has the inventory number, and if you're a picture editor at a magazine in California, you know he's the guy who you can rely on for these kinds of images. Um, the opportunity to photograph families, large groups, individuals. You'll see the iconography is kind of all over the place because it's dictated by opportunity. Who's there? Who's available? Who's awake? Who's not awake? And um, Hein, in particular, had a great affinity with children, which is something he takes with him when he works for the National Child Labor Committee from 1908 to 1918. So here he describes what it was like to be in Ellis Island, to um, work with his collaborator, Frank Manny, to have uh, this sense of the human tide and the opportunity as a photojournalist, as a documentary photographer to sort of focus on who, what, and where. And um, <clears throat> we get the focus on ground glass, of course, then hoping they will stay put and get the flash lamp ready. So you can see in some of these images the use of the flash. The figures in the foreground are very brilliantly lit. The area in the background much darker. So um, this is, of course, not only delineating the subject, but when the picture, when the photographic prints are 
being used by Paul Kellogg and other social progressive agencies, there's detail that can be uh, reproduced because the technology is, is somewhat primitive. And if you look at magazines and journals from the early 20th century, uh, the picture quality is kind of muddy. Um, and, uh, you know, not using a lithographic stone, working with a more primitive method. So um, his ability, again, to connect with kids is really something very special. This, of course, is a, an outdoor scene, and um, uh, I don't think he offered candy or any kind of inducements. I think it was just a smile uh, and ability to convey this kind of empathy that certainly would have been appreciated. So not everyone is ready for prime time. Here uh, we're seeing individuals that are clearly fatigued, uh, maybe distressed, maybe in some kind of gray area. Um, these particular images are not fully captioned in the way we see several years later with the National Child Labor Committee photographs. He doesn't well, you probably can't ask, what is your name? What is your age? How long did it take you to get here? Because of the language barriers. But is he working with individuals who, like Manny, have an ability to uh, convey information descriptively? Yes, and so these images, these early images, um, are used, as I said, in publications, but the text is not his. Having said that, he's now exploring photography as a language all its own. He actually coins the term photo story. Um, he does this, again, when he's working for the National Child Labor Committee, but this idea of using pictures as a language, using pictures as a modernist device, because pictures are becoming more and more popular. The Kodak camera was introduced in 1888. So this is 20 years later when homemakers and hobbyists are enjoying photography immensely. This image is um, the patriarch. Beautiful quality of lighting. In some instances, he clearly had an opportunity to either escort someone to a spot where the lighting would be more dramatic and um, lyrical. So again, Heinz handwriting, Patriarch at Ellis Island. So these are images that are being introduced into the culture that have never been seen before. So this idea of depicting, representing the other is something that really does counteract a kind of Victorian or post-Victorian sensibility because the feeling then would be, you are invading my privacy by introducing imagery that is not polite. Very Joseph Stella-like image Again, is Hein mindful of what Stieglitz is doing at the little galleries? You bet he is. He's bringing his ethical culture students to the galleries. He's looking at art. He's reading about Renaissance painting. He's aware of other artistic traditions and incorporating them as best he can. Definitely a Madonna and child influenced composition. Um, just a really beautiful image that I think to the average viewer would certainly give them pause, if nothing else, in terms of their predilections, their political persuasion. And this is clearly what Paul Kellogg and the progressive community is very much focused on. How can we shift popular sensibility and move the country forward in a way that's more inclusive.
So the other thing I want to say is, you know, around the um, bicentennial celebration a long time ago, there were numerous Ellis Island hind photographs that would be shown on TV or um, other kinds of media outlets, and his name was never mentioned. So the images became the carrier, the vehicle, but this idea of who made those photos? What's his story? What's his background? Whatever happened to him? That really didn't start to get addressed until around, um, I don't know, it was like 1990, the US Postal Service approached me about how can we create a postage stamp honoring Lewis Hine? Which picture shall we use? And in the end, they used a child labor photograph, and it was part of a set of, I think, 20 gorgeous, beautifully engraved postal postage stamps by other major photographers of the period. So Dorothea Lange, migrant mother, Margaret Bourke White, and um, Walker Evans, other figures. But looking at these pictures and recognizing he didn't even get credit for them in terms of popular culture then, and for the most part, uh, culture later on in the century. So here you can really see the use of the flash and the idea of how to delineate the young woman's outfit and the kind of worn wall behind her. Um, I mean, these images are just, they're so poignant. And um, later on in the 1970s, about 1976, Alan Trachtenberg, who's a um, professor of American studies at Yale, works with a couple by the name of Walter and Naomi Rosenblum to mount the first Lewis Hine exhibition, retrospective, at the Brooklyn Museum and it's a runaway success. They publish a catalog with Aperture, which I believe is now like the Dn Arbus monograph in its 30th printing. So Heinz's work um, certainly catches fire, but I would say it happens 30, 40 years after his death. So again, he's articulating some of the ideas associated with photography as a representational art form, uh, as a photojournalistic art form. And here you, we see an ad that he created uh, for the charities in the commons. You can not only buy pictures for exhibits, reports, folders, magazine, and newspaper articles. And like Jacob Rees, he also made lantern slides. Um, I love that the Charities and Commons was at 105 East 22nd Street when Swan Galleries is at 104 East 25th Street. So looking again at more of these images and seeing the ways in which He's expanding his iconography um, to include this kind of sense of enclosure, separation, these visual cues that um, in the photo world are really first being articulated by people like Alfred Stieglitz, who's publishing a magazine called Camera Work in which he is presenting photography as a modernist art form. And he's really getting a lot of pushback. I mean, the subscriber rate in the beginning, uh, maybe 500 people. By the end, in 1914, 1915, maybe 200 people. So this kind of idea of how pictures are constructed and the meanings associated with pictures, um, really important for Hein and very articulate in how he writes about it. So this is actually the cover of the catalog, American Lewis Hine. So once he's 
done with Ellis Island, which is about 1907, 1908. He continues to photograph immigrants, uh, especially immigrant children on the street, the Lower East Side, throughout the city. And some of these images have, let's just say, a more upbeat quality about them, more spontaneous quality about them. And this obviously comes with the experience of handling a bulky Graflex camera. I mentioned Florence Kelly, who was the, I believe, chief of the Consumers League. She hires Hein to go into te uh, tenement homes. Uh, many of them were actually in Soho in New York City on Thompson Street, on McDougal Street, and um, photograph families at work making flowers, making candies, making all kinds of product that could be uh, processed and sold. Again, he's still using a flash, uh, the ability to make these pictures with natural light, not so easy, um, and the composition, all very intentional. So what we're seeing at the top of the frame is as important as what we're seeing in the foreground and the back of the frame. Into uh, the 1920s, he's looking at this notion of labor and how it dignifies the individual and creates a kind of context for one's life that um, isn't necessarily uh, celebrated in our culture. Of course, in 1930, he is invited to photograph the construction of the Empire State Building which the laborers were, uh, in many instances, Mohawk Indians. And so he uh, does that project as well as a kind of um, uh, highlight of his latter career. Very few men in these pictures of families at work. And so it's an interesting kind of um, a uh, picture to see a husband as part of the crew, as part of the labor force. Again, going back out to the street and having this familiarity with, I mean, I guess one could characterize it as a kind of work rhythm. He knows what he wants. He's looking for a particular type of image. And something like this is, um, very deserving of Stieglitz's attention, but Stieglitz being the kind of um, impresario that he is, is working with individuals, be they photographers or collectors or aficionados, who are of a different social class. And Heinz's efforts to um, ingratiate himself, to basically be part of that community are not well received. Having said that, his student at the Ethical Culture School, a young man named Paul Strand, he is embraced by Stieglitz, and the last two issues of camera work are actually devoted to his work. By 1908, 1909, Hein is traveling 60,000 miles a year for the National Child Labor Committee, often accompanied by a witness, otherwise known as a reporter. And um, the photographs that he's making are very copiously annotated because his job as a photographer was to prove, irrevocably demonstrate, that child labor was rampant. And so um, he took his work very seriously. And as I said, over the years, we see a stylistic advancement, a sophistication, if you will, in the types of pictures that he's making. He's uh, invited to be part of the Pittsburgh survey, a multi-year project that the Russell Sage Foundation underwrites, and he's the chief photographer. There are myriad photojournalists that are, in, uh, I'm sorry, journalists that are involved. 
in documenting conditions in immigrant communities that um, steal coal, all kinds of um, labor force that uh, very much compromised by the work that they're doing. But again, here he's elected for a different type of image, a very upbeat, celebratory image of family and work. This is also part of the Pittsburgh survey. You see the leggings this guy is wearing to do his job. I mean, again, these are details that Heinz very sensitive to and aware that um, these individuals are in highly compromised situations. So looking at hand stamps, recognizing that when there is a hand stamp, when there is a caption, when there is a signature, these are all pluses and really great markers. But for the most part, um, Stieglitz never signed a photograph, and Hein, when it came to these contact prints, uh, rarely signed them. And so looking at the size of the print, the quality of the paper, because pretty much throughout his career, He's using a five by seven inch contact print. He's, he doesn't work in the darkroom himself. He hires a darkroom technician who makes the prints on a single weight semi-gloss paper. So in terms of um, Hein, Stieglitz, Walker Evans, be believe it or not, a lot of the ways in which we identify these photographers is the display method, how they're producing work, how consistent that is. Another image associated with the Pittsburgh survey. And then here's the first and second postal stamps. So this young child working at a mill, Addy, I get a call at Swan, I don't know, long time ago, 15 years ago, that um, a novelist is working on finding these children and interviewing them for a story that she's writing about child laborers. And she found her. Um, this is again, a while back before the internet really facilitates this kind of connection. And um, I've since learned of other writers and caring individuals who decided, I wanna find some of these kids and see what they're doing today. So here he is, Mr. Hine, Lewis Wicks Hine, 1874 to 1940. I would say in this picture, this is probably done, given his gray hair, around 1920. And then this picture, the end of his life, a uh, very tough decade after completing the Empire State Building Project. Um, the FSA, Farm Security Administration official, Roy Stryker, uh, doesn't have any interest in hiring Hein because of his age. In the meantime, Hein is taking pictures from cherry pickers 80 stories high uh, during the construction of the Empire State Building. I'm not sure he was like beam balancing, but I wouldn't put it past him. And so Stryker hires younger photographers like Walker Evans, Dorothea Lang, Arthur Rothstein, and Hein actually dies in poverty and neglect. Um, but on a upbeat note, uh, he does meet Beaumont Newhall, who is then the chief curator of photography at MoMA. He does meet Bernice Abbott and her partner, Elizabeth McCauslin. And these folks are very clear that this is a talent that has been overlooked. Newhall includes a number of Heinz images in a show that he curates in Paris and New York at the Jeux de Palme. And when I spoke to him, uh, when I was writing my second book, 
he was very clear about how the documentary photograph, the human document, as Hein referred to it, was an artistic document. And he had no problem making that kind of imaginative leap. Bernie Sabat and um, McCauslin organized a retrospective uh, on the Upper West Side of New York at the Nicholas Brausch, I want to say, museum. Museum is um, no longer there, but the lobby in which the show was held, um, I just saw a couple of years ago, and I felt fairly certain the spirit of Lewis Hine was still there. So thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Along the lines of what you were just saying <clears throat> about the intention of the photographer and whether or not it is art or document or that distinction, whether or not it's valid, I, I did notice that the one photograph of the people going upstairs at Ellis Island it was climbing into America. Mm -hmm. And his, he called his own work interpretive photographs. Mm -hmm. And so I, I thought that's a real cue as to <clears throat> how he sees his own work. You are absolutely right, and interpretive photography is a catch-all term that he uses upon moving to Yonkers. So, um, I'm sorry, to Hastings on Hudson. He and his wife had been living in Yonkers. And so, just as he invents the term photo story, and picture essay, and time exposure, which are these montages of pictures and words that are, I mean, this is long before it's really in common usage or artistic usage. You're absolutely right. He's trying to position photography in a new way. Oh, let me follow up, if I may. Sure. The, uh, did he <clears throat> ever gra graduate? He must not have used glass plates for his career because they were basically been not available. Did he ever use roll film or anything? No roll film. Because the, the, the sensibility of that first picture mm -hmm. with the horse on the right, uh, uh, juxtaposed with the Stieglitz picture, what, with the guy's leg going out the other side, of the, that was just crazy Winogrand. I mean, that, <laughs> was, that was so, so street yeah. photography. And the guy walking down the street with this stuff on his back, that wasn't like an Ache picture of a tradesperson. That mm -hmm. was like a person in motion. I was like, that is really hard to do with that Graflex. And I'm wondering if that sensibility ever got translated into a, a kind of, I didn't see much of that later on, which were more what you'd expect from a Graflex. You're absolutely right. In fact, the work from the 20s and 30s kind of suffers from a lack of spontaneity except for the Empire State Building. Yeah, right, right. And why is that? Um, not exciting enough assignments? Uh, economic hardship? I mean, a uh, troubled son? I'm sure there are a lot of personal reasons, professional reasons, but uh, I can only agree with you. The work that he did in Europe on assignment with the American Red Cross, very much of this spirit, and that's the period when he uses the language of the photo story in, um, in its earliest ways, earliest manifestation. And you can see there's kind of a struggle with, I know pictures and text will work, but the design is a little clunky, or the pictures are still a little muddy in how they're reproduced, but the idea is there. Yeah. <clears throat> Client expectations, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, that was great. Was, Hi, Bob. He, was he a friend of Jacob Reese? 
And, and it's like Jacob Rees, when he did his social photographs, mm -hmm. also wrote books about them. Mm -hmm. And that seemed to make it play more. Was Did Hein ever add long, you know, more booky parts to his uh, photo books? A great question. He didn't write books. Um, he did contribute short essays, captions to his photos. To your other question, you know, Jacob Rees is a very interesting figure because he was a journalist. He is associated, in fact, credited for the most part with the pictures, but he didn't make them. He hired two, uh, two photographers associated with um, Stieglitz's early organization, the name of which escapes me, but the photographers were Richard Ho Lawrence and Henry Pifford, and like Kine and his flash pulver, they accompanied Reese on his walks through the Mulberry End and areas of Little Italy in New York that were very troubled, very violent. And um, if you read How the Other Half Lives, it's not a very glowing um, endorsement of these individuals. In fact, it's kind of problematic. Um, having said that, Reese did have a later career delivering lectures with lantern slides, and he bought Heinz lantern slides and included them in his lectures. So did they know one another? Probably, because um, they kind of traveled in similar, s similar artistic circles, but Hein was really someone who identified with the progressive community in New York. Another question. I'm, I'm curious about uh, Heinz's financial side. Um, you mentioned he dies in poverty. Um, can we assume then that his photo agency was not successful? Or is this a case of a really good artist, but a really bad businessman? <laughs> <laughs> I think the answer is yes to both. So the picture agency idea is a very, um, has a lot of currency and traction the first 15 years of the century because these are hot topics. Immigration, Ellis Island, child labor. I mean, uh, the Child Labor Act was never passed. I mean, the agency was not successful, but state by state addressed the issue. And so Hein worked for the National Child Labor Committee for 10 years. He produced a lot of pictures, all of them, by the way, at the Library of Congress. So um, I think that once he returned from Europe in 1919 and was looking to sink his teeth into another big project, and he looked at what he called the celebration of American labor and the work portrait, he had a lot of trouble finding patrons for that. And again, it was only with the Empire State Building, and apparently that happened because his neighbor, Richard Shreve, was associated with the architectural firm that designed the building. So um, he's, um, he's in his late 40s, early 50s, and he's doing it. And uh, if you haven't seen those images, they're extraordinary. And at that point in his career, certainly for the opening in the lobby of the Empire State Building, he starts making enlargements of the prints. And they're sometimes sepia-toned, sometimes signed in block letters, H-I-N-E, on the front, not on the back. And um, you know these prints are very rare, very desirable, very beautiful. And then throughout the 1930s, he's looking to make enlargements. 
And that's what Abbott and McCauslin also show at their exhibition. So, um, yeah, not a successful <laughs> businessman. Related to that last question, um, do you think that his subject material made people feel uncomfortable? What a smart audience. <laughs> well, certainly the Ellis Island portraits and did. I was going to say, and the National Child Labor Committee portraits, but I think with those, it really depends on what and how the how the child is depicted. Um, some of them just convey this extraordinary empathy, a real sense of poignancy, look at this situation. And of course his, um, his notes will say, this child works 15 hours a day, they started their career at age five, there are 12 children. I mean there really is a story there that fleshes out um, what you're seeing, um, but the work portraits and photographing men and women at their jobs, there's not the same um, sense of urgency. There's definitely not the same kind of what you were looking at, a kind of visual fluidity. They're much more static. And it says something to me about maybe, you know, a rigidity that's beginning to, but then that just all disappears in 1930-31. So I don't want to psychologize, I just, I don't know. But I think in this picture we see a kind of resignation. I mean, there's a real sense of, hmm, sadness. And so the work transcends that, and I prefer to look at the work. So thank you so much.